Hi, welcome. My name is Alexandra Johnston, and I'm one of the organizing team of the Linguistics Career Launch. And my day job is working as director of the master's in language and communication in the Department of Linguistics at Georgetown University, where I teach intercultural communication and career management for linguists. So today we're gonna to talk about resumes two, refining and tailoring your resume. I'm going to share my screen so we can start looking at slides on how to do that. All right, looking good to the crowd. You can see what you need to see. Thank you. All right, our agenda for today. First, we're gonna recap your comprehensive resume, which we introduced last week. We're gonna talk about a structure for effective resume bullets which I'm gonna call the star bullet. And when it comes to interviews, we call it the star story. It goes by many names and there's a resource in the chat so that you can look this up online as well. I'll give an example of how to convert information from a CV to a resume. And I'll also show you how to use the job announcement as a source document for your resume language and framing. And this is how you can put your linguistic analysis skills to work. Everything you already know about being a linguist will help you in your job search and in your resume writing. Because what are we if not experts in analyzing linguistic data and looking for patterns? So consider your resume and the job announcement and any accompanying materials as your linguistic data and we'll be seeking out patterns that you can use so that you can position your resume to make it a good fit for the job announcement that you're interested in. You already have those skills. This is just a new area of genre analysis for you. <clears throat> so the comprehensive resume was something we talked about last week, which is a file just for you that has all details of your achievements and experiences. And again, experiences broadly speaking, that can include volunteer experience, part-time, unpaid experience, anything in which you accomplished something that had impact. And in that file, you wanna keep all those dates, the duration of the project or the, the job that you had, titles, any quantification, any grant numbers or amounts of grants or money that you brought in, because you're gonna forget these really quick. Uh, it happens sooner than you think. So this is kind of to keep everything related to your prior experience so that you can draw from it. That's your source material to create a one to two page tailored resume for a specific job application. Now you will read and revise your tailored resume according to every new job announcement, position, and organization you apply to. So you may not completely rewrite that shorter version of your comprehensive resume. It may not be a complete revamp from the ground up, but you definitely want to invest some time in reading that tailored resume and checking the fit between that resume and the job announcement and the qualifications and responsibilities that you need to have in that position you're applying to. So that time invested will pay off. Um, so reading and revising every resume before you turn it in as part of your job application is really necessary so that you can position yourself in the best possible way. So part of making your resume really effective is to use what's called the star method or star story or star bullet. You can find this on the web everywhere. It's not a secret, but it stands for situation, task, action, results. And this provides a structured and succinct way to present the results, meaning the impact of your actions. It's concise, which is what you want. It applies to both oral and written genres. And by that, I mean, you can use a star story or this star method for networking situations. 
They're especially useful to structure your answers to job interview questions. So you, you may have heard of behavioral, behavioral interview questions, and I'm sure you've been through these before. These are the type of interview questions that start with, tell me about a time when, when you uh, overcame a challenge at work, or tell me about how you handled a situation with a difficult coworker. Um, these are behavioral interview questions that have as an expected genre response, a narrative in this form. So whenever you hear this, tell me about, or have you ever, the answer isn't a yes or no, it's a concise narrative using this structure. So this is a powerful genre structure. Now you can also use this STAR method when it comes to writing your resume bullets and your LinkedIn bullets, okay? But for those, you may want to shrink down parts of this structure and really focus on the action and the results. This is why resume bullets start in the format of an action verb followed by highlighting your results. So we're really gonna focus on action and results for your resume, which is a way to highlight your accomplishments. It's like, you know, a brag document, something that, that showcases you and your achievements. And it's supposed to. I shouldn't use the word brag, that has negative connotations, but in this genre, it's expected that you showcase your achievements and take ownership for them. Okay, so let's flesh this out. What do we mean by situation? This is just a brief, concise description of a situation, a problem, or a conflict that you faced. This may not be so necessary, again, in a resume bullet, but you definitely want to use this as context setting in response to an interview question. Task. What were you tasked with doing? What were your responsibilities or goals in that situation that you faced? So briefly describe your role um, in taking on actions. What actions did you take? How did you solve the problem? And this is where you start with a resume bullet, pretty much starting with that action. And uh, Marcus is going to drop a list of action verbs in the chat. This resource is very useful for providing you with those, those words that hiring managers seek in resumes. And what's good about this document that will come to you is that it's organized in different, um, <laughs> it, it has a taxonomy of organizations. So if you're looking for action verbs related to communication or related to management or related to uh, leadership, you can check those columns of, of verbs. Finally, results. What was the outcome? How can you quantify it? How can you describe the impact or lasting effects? So the results are where hiring managers, people who read your resume are looking for impact. And if you can quantify it with some kind of number, some kind of data, that's very useful. But as we know, there are a lot of uh, qualitative effects of, of it, ways that you can describe impact. So in that sense, you could talk about the lasting effect of what you did, how you affected a process, or how people responded to your results, and what effect did that have for your organization. We'll get to that. But remember, we're focusing on action and results for your resume. Here's an example. So this is some resume language, and this is a star story that someone has used. New hires at my organization weren't ready to navigate our data tracking system by the end of their two week onboarding session. It was taking them four weeks. Okay, time is money. That's a problem. The task that this person had, they had to help trainees learn to use the system faster. The action, this person wrote and edited the company's first training manual, successfully presented proposal for adoption to management, and revised training curriculum built around manual use and guidelines. There's the action step. Results, trainees learned the system in two weeks. 
manual was adopted company-wide and is still in use after three years. Okay, so that shows the effect of this person's action. It shows some longevity. It shows a way that the company was able to um, save some time, save some money. And this may seem like, hmm, this is kind of resume ease. It sounds very corporate-y. I can't relate to this. But if you've ever been a graduate student who had to manage a research team of undergraduates, this is kind of analogous. If you had to train undergraduate students you hired to help you with your dissertation project, and you needed them to learn how to use a specific tool, maybe you're training them to use MaxQDA to code uh, your data. Um, and you wrote them a training manual on how to use it and what you were looking for in terms of coding and results. Maybe that's kind of analogous. Or maybe you wrote a manual for your graduate student um, you know, labor organization, and that was new. And that was implemented and adopted and proved very useful to managing, for managing at meetings effectively and for charting a path forward for that labor organization. So there are ana analogous situations that I know many of you have had uh, in your academic work so far. And you can think of ways that you can apply this structure to presenting those results and impact. Okay, so here's an example of a final bullet point showing those actions and results. Initiated, designed, and delivered the first training manual for our company's data tracking system, which reduced training period for new hires by 50%, was adopted company-wide and is still in use three years on. So here we have starting out with a whole slew of action verbs and describing the results of that. Now you can see in this bullet point that the same achievement here can be reframed to highlight different skills that we wanna be aligned with the skills that are sought in the job announcement. So this bullet can be used to show your communication skills because you had to present this to management, you had to use persuasive communication to get them to allow you to write this and present it to trainees. That shows your persuasion, it shows leadership, it also shows your experience training, which is a, a sought after um, experience. This can also function as what uh, Anna Marie Truster calls a pocket story, or that we might call a response to a job interview question um, that you can sort of pull out of your pocket when needed to answer a question. So again, as we were talking about those behavioral interview questions, you might be faced with a question like, tell me about a time you faced a challenge at work. This could be one of those stories that you pull out of your pocket and use as an answer to this question. It's multifunctional and multi-use though, because you could also use the same story to answer the question, tell me about a time you influenced without authority. I love this phrase very much because not many of us have authority to tell people what to do and get them to do it. So often we're trying to persuade people to do things without having the organizational authority to, to make them. So to use this type of a, a bullet point or a pocket story, a star story, to answer that type of question can be very effective because it shows you have the persuasive communication skills to get people to do things without having that, that structural position of power necessarily. Again, you could also use this story to talk about, have you ever had to create buy-in for a process improvement? This sounds like one of those businessy corporate questions maybe, but likely you've had experience doing this. Likely you've contributed to your university in some way to improve a process, whether it's in a student-led group um, in, your, in your labor organization, something to do with your department, something to do with organizing a conference where you have to influence stakeholders. That just means that people will have an interest in your project who you have to persuade and work with. And you've, you've probably done something analogous to this. 
Okay, revising a bullet from generic to genius. Oh, I was having too much fun labeling this, but let's look at a pretty straightforward bullet point that I might see on any resume and that frankly I had on my own resume because it's taken me a long time to learn this. Um, we're all starting from different points on this journey and this is not something you know unless you're taught. We don't just know this stuff and that's why it's so um, impressive that you that you came to this and that you're learning about this because nobody expects you to know this without practicing and uh, learning it but they shouldn't. All right, so at one point I was a Fulbright chapter events coordinator. I put down responsible for organizing events and panels. Eh? This is not a job, this is a job description and it is not an accomplishment. So this is not effective at all. If I look at this as a hiring manager, I'll be like, so what? That's what you're supposed to do. What did you actually accomplish? What skills did you use? What was the impact? Did you identify and recruit speakers? Did you publicize these events? Did you make media appearances? Did you create differentiated messaging? What kind of events were these? And for what purpose? Why did you even organize these? I can't tell this from this job description up here that was put on my resume. Tell me how many people attended. Did attendance increase? Did increased attendance lead to increased membership, visibility, and impact of this chapter? I want to know what was the point here. So here's a revision of that bullet point. Planned and delivered public discussion panels on timely topics, such as the Iowa caucuses, for audiences of 50 plus US Fulbright alumni and international grantees on a bi-monthly basis. Okay, so here we have some action verbs starting it off, planned and delivered, and we're using a verb like delivered, which is often used in job announcements in the corporate world, and it's good to use that word. Timely topics, okay, they were related to social issues that were in the news, um, like the Iowa caucuses. There's a quantification of the audience members, number and who they were, and there's the implication that it's a diverse audience of domestic and international people. And there's also a time, a duration, um, a frequency there, bi-monthly basis. Identified and engaged 30 plus state government representatives and community organization leaders to participate as panelists. Okay, there's more action verbs, there's quantification, description of who's serving as panelists. And by naming them, there's the implication that, again, you're influencing without authority because we can't just demand uh, that people participate in our panels. Created differentiated messaging for publicizing events through social media, local TV and radio, represented the Fulbright chapter and local news appearances. Okay, differentiated messaging, that's pretty nice. That's something that you may find in marketing, market research. Uh, positions. So that's a way of just saying that you know how to create messages for different audiences. Bullet number one shows organization skills. Bullet two shows that you can do research, you have interpersonal communication skills, and again, that phrase, influencing without authority. That third bullet shows things like strategic marketing execution, media savvy, social media savvy, and presentation skills. So they can each showcase some of the desired uh, skills that might be mentioned in a job announcement. And again, it's up to you to look at that announcement, see the desired skills and speak to those skills through your bullet points and the impact that you, that you claim. Okay, give us even more. Can you make it even more impactful? I just used that verb. Created marketing materials and publicized events through social media and local TV and radio. Let's boost this a little bit. Think about how broad was the reach? Were new chapter members recruited? If this is a membership organization or an alumni association, that's really important. And that's one of the goals of the 
organization. So if you're applying for any sort of association, a trade association, you would want to speak to that. Um, was there more brand recognition as a result? Okay, so how about this instead? Created marketing materials and publicized events through social media. Increased follows by 30%. Increased attendance at chapter programs by 75%. Okay, the caveat here is when you're using your stats, you want to make sure that they're accurate and that they don't misrepresent your impact. So if you were getting four people to come to your chapter program events before you started your media campaigns and afterwards you have seven people coming, I really don't want to use a statistic by, such as increased attendance by 75%. That sounds more impressive than it maybe is from going from four people to seven people. So if you can't quantify uh, in that regard, you might just wanna say created marketing materials and publicized events through social media, documented increased attendance at several chapter programs throughout the year. So in this case, I want you to keep it real. I want you to check for accuracy. Don't overinflate accomplishments, uh, but don't undersell your, yourself either. Okay, I'm going to turn to looking at CVs and giving an example of how you can turn your experience that's listed on a CV into a resume experience. So here's an example of someone who was a PhD student in linguistics. Looking at this, we can see there's uh, a lot to do with phonetics and phonology here. So um, this is CV format taken straight from a CV. And the hallmarks of that genre is that you can see very precise titles, adjunct lecturer, graduate student instructor, or you may see instructor of record, teaching assistant, guest lecturer, Everything is precisely defined according to academic position titles and levels. Academics know what this means. We know what an adjunct means. We know what a teaching assistant position is like. People outside of academia do not know. <laughs> this is something you want to remember for when you talk about your positions on a resume, you don't have to give precise titling in this way. There are times when you do want to say lecturer, but you need to describe what that means because nobody outside of academia will understand the difference or understand what a teaching assistant does. In addition, no one outside of academia will understand what's taught in optimality theory. This is a course title you don't wanna list on a resume unless you describe something about it, unless it's relevant because you will be doing applied research in phonology and, and phonetics at your job. Um, but just recall that people outside of academia don't know what sociophonetics is. Field methods, they don't understand what linguistics is, much less the field methods we use in our field. So we have to talk about these things in a different way. Finally, I just wanna note that every all the time periods here are listed by semester. Again, that's not useful outside of academia, uh, especially if you certain resumes will ask for month and year. Other res, that's typical for a federal resume. You will have to know the month and year and hours per week. In a business, corporate, nonprofit resume, you'll want to use month and year or just year. So semesters is not, widely applicable outside of academia, okay? So how can we take this, this great teaching experience and turn it into something a bit more um, that will translate outside of academia? Present your teaching experience as accomplishment. Course developer, this is better already. Course developer, you could also say course designer. Uh, or curriculum designer. 
Um, we have some people attending our LCL who are engaged in this area of curriculum design and instructional design and can let you know how these differ. Um, if you have designed curriculum as an instructor of record, you can say you are a curriculum designer or developer. Developed a new curriculum for graduate students serving as teaching assistants for the first time. Okay, so this is good here, starting with an action verb, saying what this person did. Um, it also gets at, you know, training or onboarding. That's another way to talk about uh, training new teaching assistants, training people new to a position. So this translates to onboarding experience and training experience. Led weekly classes on problem solving strategies for real time issues. Well, yeah, that's that's actually what you you do in a teacher training practicum course for sure. And that's transferable. That is widely transferable to teach uh, people how to solve problems in the workplace for real time issues. And here you can also see that it's it's quantified a bit by uh, weekly classes. And then created a structure for the practicum that's been retained throughout subsequent semesters. This is good. This is showing impact. Uh, the practicum has been adopted and is still in use today. I might change uh, the use of semesters again um, and quantify that in terms of years, months and years. And I would also change the spring 2019 to the time period, uh, month and year. But this is already a great bullet point that translates a lot of that experience in teaching into something that's relevant and transferable to a job announcement and a position. So here I, I cut and paste some responsibilities for an actual job for the position of Associate Linguistic Project Manager at Appen. I'm gonna read through these and show you what's important about these bullets. Plan and manage projects to quality time and budget to ensure effective project execution and delivery. Onboard and train a virtual team of consultants to create, evaluate, or annotate linguistic data in multiple languages. Prepare guidelines, training materials, and tools aligned to client specifications. Oversee the work of consultants, including task assignments, scheduling, and monitoring. Ensure close and regular communication with all internal project stakeholders. Document and manage language resources arising from projects. Okay, if there's some reactions in the crowd, does this sound like resume ease? Is this sounding very, very different? You can put a, a thumbs up if it sounds like very corporate to you. All right, yeah, but think about this in terms of how you can relate it to your own experience as a student, uh, undergraduate student or graduate student, or as a, as a faculty member even. Um, planning and managing projects. Anybody who's planned a research project has planned and managed a project. If you've ever had a grant, to fund that project, you have had to manage to quality time and absolutely to budget. If you've ever had to train undergraduates to help you with your dissertation data and to code it, you've onboarded and trained them. In addition, everybody this year has turned to virtual teams and virtual experiences and learning environments. So that's something that you can claim as experience. You've also likely created, evaluated, and annotated linguistic data, probably in multiple languages, because that's what we do as linguists, right? We know all the languages, <laughs> inside joke. So again, these are things that you've probably had some experience with. I'm not saying this is a perfect fit for everyone, but there are ways to think about experience as written about with this type of language and relate it to your own academic experience. In addition, we can see that there's communication required 
in order to do external communication. So in the blue highlight, your clients, the ones who have the, the timeline and are expecting a product, and also the internal project stakeholders, people within your organization, people who are working with you on the team. If you've ever worked on a, on a team as on a research project for a term paper, I think you've engaged in close and regular communication with both your, your team members, probably with your faculty members and other people who are involved in your project. And I bet many of you have documented and managed language resources. So using the language of that announcement, here are some sample bullet points. Planned and executed multiple linguistic research projects on tight timelines, keeping to maybe client, we don't know, quality budget and delivery expectations. Trained virtual teams to code, evaluate and annotate linguistic data and delivered highest level of inter annotator reliability. So I just learned that word, I think this month in one of our sessions, anyone in applied linguistics has to learn about reliable and valid uh, you know, data collection methods and how to train raters so that there's a high level of inter-rater reliability, right? That's what we do in applied linguistics. That can translate into a job announcement talking about annotation to inter-annotator reliability, making sure that everybody who's annotating the data is doing it in the same way, ensuring that through the processes you put in place to train, to observe, and to correct. So inter-annotator reliability is an example of translating an academic term of inter-rater reliability into something that would be recognized by the person, uh, by the organization uh, and those who wrote that job announcement. Also ensured on-time delivery through effective communication processes with internal and external stakeholders. I'm sure that's something you did as part of working on a team to deliver a research project. And again, we see these, these terms that are taken from the job announcement. These, have, these were all included within the job announcement. This is gonna serve you in multiple ways. First of all, if your job announcement is going through first a computer screen, some sort of applicant tracking system or ATS, the computer is going to run a match on the words you use in your resume and the words that are used in the job announcement. And they're gonna go for a percentage match and spit that out. This is something that you can actually check for yourself using free online tools like Resume Tracker and other ones, which I'll, I'll put in the chat later. Um, job Scan is another one where you can get a few free scans to check the percentage agreement between the words you have in your resume and the job announcement. And there's a lot of um, AI behind the scenes making recommendations for you to how to on how to align more with the job announcement. However, that's that's for larger organizations who do have that computer screen. That absolutely happens with federal jobs, with all of the applications. But in larger corporations, they'll run an ATS. And when you have a human though looking over your resume, that human is also going to be looking for that match and picking up on where you use terms that are, are naturalized within that organization and that position. And they'll make note, hmm, yes, this person understands our language. They're using terms that I use. This seems like a fit. You might talk about the same skills without using those words. I mean, just to go back, you might talk about inter-rater reliability. That's a very close translation. Um, but you might, you might talk about doing sociolinguistic interviews in a resume. Nobody outside of academia will know sociolinguistic interview. However, they'll understand a word like, a phrase like qualitative semi-structured interview. That's what you should use. Always try to figure out how you can translate those keywords into words your resume reader or the computer is going to pick up on. Okay, format. A lot of you have asked about the format of the resume. 
you have to keep it simple. For your comprehensive resume, that's absolutely going to be formatless, <laughs> pretty much. Um, and that's because in many, many cases, you're going to be asked to input resume information manually. You've put in all this work on making a beautiful resume with color and formatting, and then you're forced to enter information manually. So as much as possible, just keep the format really simple. I mentioned in the last session about having a display resume, sort of a display copy that can be used when you physically hand over a resume to, to a person or a lovely PDF that you can upload when you're allowed to upload a PDF. But for those times where you have to upload into a text box or upload information um, into several text boxes, try to keep the formatting really simple so that you because it's going to be stripped anyway once it's put into that online format. And finally, just some tips for when you do upload um, a resume, you do want it to be in a PDF format. So that preserves the formatting that you worked hard on. And so the person on the other end is guaranteed to see it in the state in which you sent it. Put a descriptive label like Johnston resume position hiring managers, anybody who has uh, received a resume that's just simply labeled resume is going to have that moment of, <laughs> I have to relabel this. I have to save it in a way so I can track this person. And please don't submit a resume that's labeled draft version two, final, 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 which often, you know, we forget to check. We just want it to have that clean, effective description. I'm going to stop here and return so I can, I can view all of you and so that we can build out some of the, the presentation and take some of your, your questions. So that's the, that's the formal slide portion of it, but now I would love to answer any of your questions. So please feel free to put up your digital hand and I'm gonna also scroll through the chat. I see in the, chat. <laughs> Thank you for nice reactions. See in the chat, does the order of the bullet points or skills matter on a resume? I, yeah, yeah, I would want to, I would want to upfront the most important, most germane skills and accomplishments, you know, at the top. And, you know, if you sense from the job announcement that communication maybe it's for a communication manager position. If you sense that that is the, the core responsibility, you would definitely want to discuss your communication skills and impact in the, the top bullet point, you know, with examples of a result. Um, and you don't want to, you know, that gets also to quantity of bullet points. It doesn't have to be a list of 10 things. If you have 10 bullet points, you really need to consolidate. 10 bullet points is fine for your comprehensive resume. But when you are editing for space and for impact on a tailored resume, you know, keep it, keep it kind of simple. There's no pure guide that applies across the board, but you know, three-ish. And Juan Felix, I see you have your hand up. Would you like to unmute? Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask, because you brought up the um, you know, the idea about like um tailoring the names of the positions that you, um, you know, that you have um, into the field that you're applying to. So um, with that, is, is it okay uh, for you to have like a different thing in your resume compared to your LinkedIn, for example? Because I know like, you know, maybe some employees would try to, or want to know more about you. So they try to look at your LinkedIn and then found out that it's not really coinciding with what, uh, with the title that you have in your resume. So is um. that a yeah, I appreciate that question so that, you know, we can clarify this. <clears throat> so it's not claiming a completely different title. I think if you are, you can have titles that have a broad understanding placed on your LinkedIn. Um, so you can put teaching and research and list some projects and accomplishments within teaching and research. For example, um, you can list the institution where you worked. So 
for example, I could put, you know, Georgetown and list list a title and list some research that I've done. For the individual resumes, you would want to make sure that the title gets at what you did. Uh, you know, but it doesn't have to be as specific as we would make it in academia with using a term like instructor of record or, um, you know, it's, it's not a means of inflating or misleading, but just a way to try and get a broadly understandable um, position name for that, for what you did. Um, because not many people outside of academia know exactly what a teaching assistant does. It's really up to us to explain what we accomplish as a teaching assistant or as a, as a research assistant. That's why in the CV example that I gave, um, describing that as researcher rather than research assistant, you know, that's, that's fine. Um, if it is an academia adjacent job or a job in which you are applying to do research within an organization, um, you would want to show your, your, your level by indicating if you've managed people or not. And that can help to align with some of the, the desired qualifications of the job announcement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Taylor, I see your hand up. Yeah, so one thing I've um, struggled with is, you know, as graduate students um, and potentially undergrads too, you kind of do different things at different times, right? So like it's kind of a hodgepodge of like being a research assistant and teaching. Um, and whenever I, so I, I guess I have two questions. One is, um, you know, say I was a graduate student or a graduate assistant in one semester and then, you know, I taught two semesters and then I was a graduate assistant again, right? I d it's very tedious and seems redundant to like put those dis uh, disjoint experiences separately. Right. On the other hand, I may have been doing very different uh, work in those two things. So um, my question is sort of how to handle that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that relates to the, you know, the previous question too is, you know, in that case, you, you want to show what you did. It's not important to show necessarily the actual position. I was teaching assistant one semester, I was RA, and then I went back to TA. What we've all done. You want to show, you know, the buckets of experience and impact and results that you've had. Research, teaching. That's a good way to break it down. The other bucket of experience that you have as a graduate student is the service experience, which we all, you know, we all have to do, right? And so for that, you can talk, everybody's had to, you know, help out in producing a conference, doing conference organization work, right? Um, at some point or something similar, be on a committee, do a project for the department, assist the chair. And for that, you know, you can talk about event management if you helped put on a conference. You can talk about, you know, essential administrative skills that you have and that you used when you were assisting the chair. Um, you can talk about the administration experience that you've had. So you really do want to, you know, within an organization, if you put your university as your organization affiliation, then you just describe uh, the different, you know, buckets of experiences and results that you've had. Here. Okay. Can I ask a, sort of a follow-up question just to make sure I understand how that works practically? Um, which is, um, so would it make sense then to have like sort of one thing where you're like researcher um, and then you might say that you did that, you know, it, I guess I'm thinking about like when you're, you have the dates and it's like kind of awkward because you're like, well, I don't know if they, they probably don't care but I always feel weird about it being like, oh, I did this for like this time, you know, um, that's, I guess that's my <laughs> question of like, how do you handle that? Like you wanna be honest, obviously, but uh, I don't think they probably super care about what the timeline of every little thing, you know? 
Yeah, so this is an overarching question of how do you handle multiple roles within the same organization over time? So for that, you could have your university and then your period of affiliation as the date, you know, uh, September 2015 to May uh, 2021, <laughs> whatever it is. And within that, that's when you can break it up by your 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 different roles as researcher, okay. teacher. Uh, and, and, then, and then not list specific dates for each of those things. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be because you want to showcase the accomplishments that you, right. you okay. had, that you can claim for yourself. So under researcher, how many projects did you work on over what length of time, managing how many people with what outcomes? For event management, you know, consider how many conferences you you volunteered on, and you don't have to use the word volunteer, but that you know, um, coordinated the Georgetown University Roundtable with a team of five to, um, you know, schedule panelists, uh, market, and you know, all of the stuff that's associated with a conference. Um, what you do also want to show too, when you have multiple roles within one organization, multiple positions, is if you can, you want to highlight advancement within that organization to show that when you've been there over time, you've increased your responsibilities and been given more responsibility. Perhaps you've, you're now in a manager position uh, rather than a assistant position. So by showing that's when different position titles that show clear advancement can be very useful because that that showcases your leadership and the fact that you're given more responsibility over time by that organization. Um, what is a practicum exactly? See, yeah, that's not a widely used expression. In this sense, a teaching practicum is, is where you teach teachers how to teach and you observe them teaching and you train them in teaching. So again, like this is why too, I want to encourage all of you to run your resume by another person. <laughs> you bring a resume, you ask somebody you're doing an informational interview with who is in that sector, who's in that area or even that organization. Do you mind just running your eyes over my resume to see if I'm, if I'm on target with how I'm talking about my skills? And this is actually not asking a lot from people because you know how long most hiring managers spend looking through a resume? It's a few seconds. It's not even minutes. For hiring managers at bigger organizations, it could be seven seconds at most. Um, and so they're scanning very quickly for keywords, which is why those are gonna leap out to them when they run their eyes over it. You can actually, I didn't have time to put this in to take time today, but you can actually do that exercise yourself online where you're presented with 10 resumes over the course of one minute, they flash a job announcement description, and then they put up a resume for six seconds. You look at it and you choose higher or not. And then you compare your results, looking at those 10 resumes over a minute with an actual hiring manager. You'll be surprised how, how much you'll find yourself aligning with the hiring manager. It doesn't take that long. So please bring your resume. To, to someone to look at, at, more than one person. It really helps to get that feedback on what terms are understandable and which aren't, and how you can highlight yourself more. There may be areas where you're underplaying your accomplishments. And the question about quantification, I, I appreciate what um, has been put in the chat about this. You know, as I was uh, saying in the presentation, there are times when you when you can put numbers to it, right? But there are times when numbers are misleading. So you want to think too about how you can qualify your accomplishments, how you can talk about the impact your accomplishment had um, in terms of process improvement, in terms of um, you know qualitative. Um, improvement or a qualitative effect on people's lives or on a team in your organization. It doesn't have to be numbers, but to, to think about ways you can describe the impact um, qualitatively is also really useful. Mm -hmm. 
How should LinkedIn differ from resume? That's a great uh, question to ask and something we can follow up when we have our projected LinkedIn session together sometime during the month. But LinkedIn is a place where you can add in it's kind of a cross between a tailored resume and a comprehensive resume. You can add in experiences, you can add in volunteer work, you can add in publications. There are many sections within the LinkedIn profile that you can choose to expand to your heart's content. And it's, it's limited, it limits the information that viewers can see as they quickly scroll. So within each section, you can get in about, uh, you know, two or three position experiences before a viewer has to click more uh, in every section. So that's why in a LinkedIn profile, profile you wanna highlight the most uh, important positions, the most recent ones, and highlight the most important accomplishments within those positions, uh, because you can't count on people to click more all the way through. Um, you can also add in multimedia to your LinkedIn uh, that's easily clickable in a way that a resume entry won't be. So you can add in your website, you can add in um, publications, link to them, you can add in video of presentations that you've appeared in, TED Talks, uh, class presentations. So that's a way that you can really gather a lot uh, fuller representation of yourself and even show a bit of personality in a way that you might not be able to in a brief tailored resume. Aubrey, I see your hand up. Hi, yes. Um, so I asked this question in the chat. I don't think it got um, answered. It's okay, it got buried. Um, so I have uh, the issue where I've been um, working on a lot of like small contract jobs and uh, short-term uh, you know, experience. Um, and I was doing that while I was a full-time student or while I was working full-time. So in the end, it just adds up to a lot of entries, but most of them are still relevant. Um, so I was wondering if uh, you have any ideas about how to like group things. Um, for example, like I taught ESL for multiple you know, online uh, companies like VIP Kit or whatever, and they're kind of similar. So, have you ever seen that done um, or is it better to just leave some off? Yeah, so this is a question about, you know, editing your experience, what, what you leave in, what you, what you keep out and how to present multiple similar experiences with different organizations um, effectively and concisely. So in that sense, you could start with your teaching experience and uh, list, so that can be, in your experience section and you can list out uh, the type of teaching like uh, uh, designed and delivered English as a second language courses to adult learners from novice to advanced levels over five years. That might be a way to encapsulate the type of experiences you've had. And then you could sort of parenthetically list some organizations as examples if necessary. So, so you so kind of flip it, huh? You say like what you did and then put yeah. a couple of, okay, interesting. Yeah, so that's that's how I've handled, um, you know, for my own, you know, similar experiences in different organizations. And then you can also focus on, you know, some results of that, you know, uh, train uh, tutored k-12 children in um, you know um, TOEFL like or tutored undergraduate students in TOEFL um, resulting in increased TOEFL scores for 50 percent of my clients you know, things like that if you can measure your impact you know in a relevant and um, you know, accurate way. Yeah, uh, 
quickly in the chat, Jyoti's noting that LinkedIn has internal ordering system that may not match yours, listing languages alphabetically, not by competence. And that's where you can also, you have to figure workarounds to deal with the format you're provided with LinkedIn, but it, it is pretty adaptable. So for that, um, you can add in the parentheticals either with your, your, your levels of competence in different languages, um, either descriptive, like professional working um, level, or you can um, put in your, like an actual test score for the language and when that uh, test, how long that test score is valid. So that's ways that you can kind of qualify your language skills and, and get around the ordering system. Or I think you can also enter in one line. There are ways around it. Let's see, where can I find great sample resumes for linguists working in tech? This is where your informational interviewing skills uh, can be of great use. Uh, this is where you want to ask around and get to know linguists who work in tech and see if they'll share your resume with, with you. So you can get a sense of the words they use and the type of experience that they highlight. Um, you can also ask people in tech, like some of the people who are at our LCL and presenting to see if they can look over your resume and talk about ways that you might want to highlight different experiences and results and different wording that you can use. You really can't beat this kind of interaction to get the specific information that you want. And again, most people really want to assist with this they feel good about helping you. And that's, that's what they get out of it. So especially people in this space that we're developing over the month, they're gonna be open for the most part to looking at your resume. Not if you're necessarily asking for a job. You don't wanna be asking for a job. You don't wanna be in the middle of a hiring process for a job. Perhaps you need to check in first and see if it's all right. You always check in first. But again, showing your resume is going to be a great way to, to figure out how you talk about it. You can also do this a digital research project on this by looking at linguists in tech, looking at their LinkedIn, and you'll find ways that they've described their positions and their skills and their accomplishments. And start picking up on the language, start adopting some of the language uh, if it applies to your experience and results. It's, it's not copying, it's not, um, you know, it, it's something that you can do. Um, you're not adopting somebody else's profile, somebody else's experience. You're taking words that you can apply to your own experience um, that are commonly used within the industry. So use LinkedIn as a research tool by examining linguists in tech and their career paths and how they talk about it. You can do that for any type of career path. You can look at linguists who work in nonprofits and see how they talk about what they do. You can look, look at linguists, if you put in a, as keywords in LinkedIn, linguist, strategic communication, and that will bring up people who have training in linguistics and who work in strategic communication positions. And you can see how they talk about what they do and start Start parsing that out and seeing how it applies to your own experience. I see that we're a couple minutes past the hour, so I'm going to stop recording. And I want to thank all of you for being here today. I hope parts of it were useful for you and you can apply it. Mm -hmm.